All right, everybody, welcome back. This is lesson two of the Waves and Simple Harmonic Motion Unit. Uh, this lesson is going to be on interference and resonance, and it's going to be broken down into two parts. So for part one, um, basically what we're going to look at is what happens to two waves when they travel in the same medium? Um, and basically, what happens if two waves collide with each other? Uh, what they do is they follow something called the principle of superposition, which says that the total amplitude of waves is equal to the sum of the individual amplitudes. Now, I want you to take a look here at a, at a quick video. So we're going to have two waves um, uh, in this video. So basically what I've got here is I've got a wave here coming in, moving to the right, another wave moving to the left. If they were on individual strings, you'd see them moving along. What would happen if they're on the same string like you can see here on the bottom? And so we're going to see that when they collide, they actually have kind of an additive effect. And you can imagine, well, what happens if we have um, a waves of, say, opposite phase, like a wave here that I'll call a crest and another wave here that I'll call a trough. What happens when they run into each other? We well, can see that they have a sort of a similar effect where they affect one another but travel straight through. If we pause this one again, um, just before, just when the two waves meet, let's take a look at what happens right when they're one on top of each other. You can see right in this instant, um, if you look at this line right here, this top wave has an amplitude of about two boxes, and so does this wave here. And so the total amplitude of the overall waveform will be two boxes. If you choose this point over here, for example, the top wave has an amplitude of about two boxes, and the second one has an amplitude of about one box. And so the overall amplitude would be approximately three. This is something called constructive interference, where two waves that are, say, both crests or both troughs add together to make an overall larger waveform. The um, opposite of constructive interference is destructive interference, like we might notice in this second video here where we have what I'll call a crest that's going to overlap with this trough. And we'll just pause it here right when the two of them overlap with each other. And so again, we can see, like, take a look right at this point right here. This top wave has an amplitude of what I call positive 2, two boxes high, whereas this wave has an amplitude of negative 2, or two boxes low. And overall, the waveform uh, really cancels out. So in that instant, that string or, or spring or whatever it is wouldn't actually have any amplitude at all as the two waves pass through each other. Okay, so two waves with the same frequency and phase um, will undergo constructive interference where the um, essentially the amplitudes add up to make a larger wave. And we can compare that to destructive interference, where the two amplitudes uh, subtract to make a smaller wave. Okay, so this brings us to something called um, standing waves. Now, standing waves are a phenomenon that we would have seen in class, um, where we had um, say a spring, uh, spring or a slinky or something, and we move these back and forth. And as they move back and forth, if we move at just the right frequency, there's a bunch of different waveforms that we can create. And some of the waveforms are fairly simple, like this first one here, and they get increasingly more complex. One thing I want you to notice is that if we look at these waves, you can see that they only happen at really specific frequencies, and that they seem to have either a whole wave or some um, simple fraction of waves. For example, this form right here has one complete wave contained in it, um, whereas the one next to it you can see has exactly one and a half waves contained in it, and the next one has two full waves and so on. So this regular repeating pattern is something that we're going to see, and it's something called resonance. But first off with standing waves, what I want you to notice is that on these each of these waves there are regions where the waves are moving a lot, and regions where the waves are not moving at all. So for example with this wave right here, I can see I'm not moving at the ends, but I'm also not really moving right in the, the very center of that wave. Um, whereas in this region here, there's a lot of amplitude, and this region here, there's a lot of amplitude as well. And we can see why these are called standing waves, because they don't seem to be traveling. They're not going left, they're not going right. They're just sort of stuck on the string at that point, uh, moving back and forth and back and forth, or moving not at all, depending on where we're talking about. So standing waves are caused by constructive and destructive interference. And areas of complete destructive interference have no amplitude and are called nodes. Whereas areas of uh, complete constructive interference have a large amplitude 
and they are called antinodes. So if we were to draw that real simple waveform like we saw there, it kind of goes up and down and back, and then it kind of goes back and forth like this. And we can see that, the, that this would have specifically three nodes, one, two, three areas, where the amplitude would be effectively zero, whereas it would have two regions here and here, which would be our antinodes. So we're going to kind of break this down and figure out how, what is it that causes standing waves? Like, how do we create standing waves? And in fact, standing waves are actually a function, uh, they're actually created by traveling waves. If you remember the last video, we looked at traveling waves as something where we have a disturbance in a medium, and, and the medium sort of oscillates or moves or pulses, and, and the wave travels along, the waveform sort of travels along, in this case, traveling along to the right. Um, if there's no end there, well, obviously the wave is going to keep going, but what happens if I have a fixed end? So this end here can't actually move. Let's see what happens when I send a pulse down that, uh, down that string. You'll see that when the wave pulse reaches the fixed end, um, two things happen. First of all, it reflects, uh, which is to say it just bounces back. Uh, now this is a perfect string, so it's reflecting entirely, which wouldn't happen in real life. But as it bounces back, something else happens. Because of that fixed end, the amplitude also inverts. So the amplitude, if it's a crest, flips over to a trough and vice versa. Let's compare that to if we had a loose end. So in this case, instead of this end being fixed, like somebody holding on to the end of it, maybe it's on a ring and that ring is free to slide on, um, on some sort of rod. You can see that when it reaches this free end here, it does in fact reflect, but when it reflects, it reflects back as the exact same um, thing that first impacted it. So a trough reflects as a trough and a crest as a crest, as a crest, as a crest and so on. Over here on this fixed end, we see, still see this inversion. So we can sum this up by saying that if we have a fixed end, our uh, amplitude is going to invert, whereas if we have a uh, loose end or some sort of free end, the amplitude is not going to invert when it reflects. So when it fix, uh, breaks a fixed boundary, it will reflect and invert its amplitude. If a series of waves are sent along the, uh, the string, the reflected pulse will interfere with itself. So what I mean by that is, if we have a series of waves, we can see in this case here, if I have a series of waves, when they reflect from this fixed end, those waves will actually bounce off and then they'll actually run into each other. And as they run into each other, um, they're going to interfere. And if they're uh, opposite in terms of a crest and a trough, it's going to be destructive interference, and if they're the same, then it's going to be constructive interference. So if the waves are at just the right frequency, we will create a standing wave. So just use these examples as a, as a quick comparison. What's going to happen when these two waveforms run into each other? Well, this crest and this trough, since they're identical but inverted, they're going to have destructive interference. And so the pattern would just look like, uh, I guess, a flat string. Well, what happens uh, in this next example here when two crests run into each other? Well, that would be constructive interference. And so the pattern would be one really large wave. But what happens when you've got these two crests that are both headed towards this wall? Well, this first crest is going to hit that wall, and it's going to bounce back going in the other direction and it's going to invert, and it's going to be going the opposite direction as an inverted uh, wave. It's then going to run into that crest that comes in right behind it, and so this is actually going to result in destructive interference. And the pattern, of course, is going to be cancelled out. What about this one here? A crest chasing this trough. When this trough bounces off the free end, it will not invert, so it's going to bounce back looking the exact same which means it's going to run into a crest, which means it's going to be destructive interference. In this case here, this crest will, sorry, this trough will bounce off the wall. When it bounces off the wall, it's going to invert and run into another crest, and so that'll be constructive interference. And resulting in a large crest. 
And same thing here, when this crest runs into this free end, when it reflects back, it will also reflect back without inversion, and it'll run into the next crest, resulting in constructive interference, and the pattern will be a large crest. All right, that's the end of um, part one.